Okay, well, welcome everyone to the Fall Marine Mammals Work Group meeting. Um, we're excited to have everyone come back after a long, productive, busy summer, I'm sure. So to kick off today, um, here's what the agenda is looking like. So we'll start off with welcome and announcements. I'll review the agenda. Um, and we'll also review the 2023 to 2024 Marine Mammals Work Group work plan. And that was shared over email earlier this year. We'll hear an update on the highly pathogenic avian influenza H5N1 strain found in harbor seals. And we'll be hearing from WDFW staff, Kitty Hammond and Casey Clark. We have a short breakout room activity, so a chance to chat with colleagues about what you did over the summer. So our prompt will be, what was a highlight from your 2023 summer field season? So that's a little later to make time for the influenza um, update. We'll transition into lightning talks. So we'll hear updates and presentations and discuss project monitoring results, activities, publications, etc. since the last Marine Mammal Workgroup meeting. We'll then review the new Marine Mammal Encyclopedia of Puget Sound articles um, and discuss the potential for an internal peer review process and identify future articles of interest. Um, one of the last agenda items is we'll provide feedback on the monitoring inventory framework, recovery goals, and identified threat areas to southern resident killer whales. And then we'll adjourn with next steps and action items. Great. All right, so kicking off with some announcements. Um, I'll review these. I'll also follow up after this meeting just with links and and a list of these as well. So first thing, just want to remind everyone that the Marine Birds Work Group is hosting a meeting focused on the avian influenza. Um, and this will be a deeper dive than the update we're going to have provided for us today. And that will be tomorrow from 10 to 12 p.m. I shared that agenda and link through the listserv. But like I said, I'll also send out an email right after this meeting with that agenda again. There's the Coastal and Estuarine Research Federation Conference next week. I know a couple members, I believe, are um, attending that. So just wanting to highlight that it's going to be in person in Portland, Oregon um, next week. Excited to uh, announce that the British Columbia Marine Mammal Symposium is um, scheduled for Saturday, November 25th from 9.30 to 5 p.m. at the University of British Columbia. Um, this is the 31st annual Marine Mammal Symposium. So if you have any questions about that, Andrew Trites is the point of contact. Um, another thing that I think I've shared on the listserv, but just wanted to provide another reminder that the Salish Sea Science Roundtable um, is a virtual monthly seminar that meets on the first Tuesday of each month. And these meetings are a chance to share emerging science that's shaping the Salish Sea recovery and sustainable development, as well as provides a, a opportunity to connect with colleagues in different fields. So I'll again provide that link in a follow-up email, but it's an open invite. And again, it's it's virtual. And there's uh, one after this call, right? Yeah, actually, yeah, they have one today. <laughs> so maybe Scott, you can drop that link in the chat, or I I can do that as well. Yeah, I'll grab it. Okay. Um, uh, the, it looks like Orca Network. It has a placeholder for Ways of the Whales event on Saturday, January twentieth, twenty twenty four, from nine to four p.m. Um, so wanting to announce that Society for Marine Mammalogy uh, is having a conference in 2024 in Perth, Australia. Uh, there will be open registration starting Tuesday, February 6, 2024. And the Acoustical Society of America is planning a spring meeting in May 2024. This will be in Canada. Um, I'm 
I think there is a link I will share um, when I send out this follow-up email as well. And just to note that the 2024 Salish Sea Ecosystem Conference is not likely to occur this year. Um, so just wanted to flag that for you all. Great. So with that, I, I'll pause here and see if there's any additional announcements that any members would like to share um, and, fl and flag at this time. And feel free to put that in the chat as well if there's any events that you would like to highlight. I'll just pause for one more second. Nicole, I thought of one other thing. Um, In-person, uh, I guess they're lectures at the um, University of Washington um, at, through SAFs have started up again uh, after COVID. And so um, I've just flagged that they're, they are recording them as well. So a few of them have been interesting this fall. Um, I'll, I'll drop a link to the site, but I hadn't thought of it before, but uh, some of them have to do with salmon, of course, and uh, there was one on blue whale migrations, which was very, very interesting. Um, so I'll, I'll drop that in just in case folks want to catch up either in person or um, catch up via the, the videos. Great. Thanks, Scott. All right. Well, we'll move on to the review of the 2023-2024 work plan. And like I said, Folks have seen this before, but just wanted to take time to, to kind of provide an overview. Just starting with our year, the 2022 to 23 in review. Um, so we had four full membership meetings from mid 2023 or 22 to the end of 2023. And um, that included a March, December, February, and May meeting. We covered a variety of topics, such as monitoring technology and cooperative opportunities, member research updates in lightning presentation formats. And we had presentations that covered uh, a variety of topics, the Aleutian Isle incident update, PSP noise and marine water indicator, distribution and abundance of sea lions in the inland waters of Washington, and the Southern Resident Killer Whale Remote Health Metrics. We had two ORCA occupancy workshops that many of you attended. So uh, these workshops sought to collaboratively discuss developing an occupancy indicator for both Southern resident killer whales and Biggs transient whales, and focused on sharing existing data sources, exploring data opportunities and limitations, and brainstorm the purpose of the indicator. It uh, resulted in a final scoping report for ORCA, ORCA occupancy indicator development, and that link has been, been shared out. But thanks to all who participated. Um, we had really good engagement across 25 agencies. We also, as a group, updated the ORCA's vital sign, key messages, updated existing ORCA's indicators, uh, which is the Southern Resident Killer Whale Population by Pod. And just reiterating, we produced several um, deliverable products, such as the ORCA Occupancy Scoping Report, uh, members contributed to the 2021 Marine Waters Report, and uh, members published a bunch of different articles and presented at various conferences as well. So kudos to you all. In the new work plan, um, these are kind of the, the highlights. So we'll continue holding a minimum of three full membership meetings. So that's that fall, winter, and spring, leaving the summer um, open just because it's a busy time of year for, for members. Uh, we want to increase meaningful engagement with tribal nations on marine mammal issues and continue information sharing on ORCA's vital signs ancillary measures as well. 
We'll update the ORCA's vital sign key messages and indicators as needed, review new or updated indicator reports as the need arises, as well as indicator products such as scoping reports and project plans. Um, and a component to this is also providing input on the status of data availability and feasibility of new indicators and protocols, looking to collaborate with folks who are um, looking at further developing the occupancy metric um, for ORCA in Puget Sound. And we'll contribute annual, annually to publications, um, present at conferences that inform Puget Sound ecosystem health related to various marine mammal species. And the Marine Mammal Work Group definitely will seek to support by sharing um, upcoming events and as well as tracking what members are doing. And finally, um, we're on track to develop an ORCA monitoring inventory of existing monitoring programs over the course of the year, and that's what we'll be focusing on at today's meeting. All right, so that's, I just wanted to take time this morning to provide an overview of the work plan. I'll drop the link into the chat that will take you to the full work plan that has the table, um, but wanted to just take time to do that. Any questions before we move on to the avian influenza and harbor seals update? Feel free to drop it in the chat if you do have any questions, but I will invite Kitty and Casey to unmute, introduce themselves, and you should be able to share your screen. Great. I'm here for moral support and, and back up on any specific SEAL questions. Katie's going to be leading the presentation, but good morning, everyone. Alrighty. Good morning, everyone. Hopefully you see my screen. Awesome. Thank you. So yeah, um, like Nicole mentioned, uh, Dr. Scott Pearson and I are giving a much more comprehensive version of this uh, talk tomorrow. I just kind of pulled out the slides that are specific to harbor seals and um, H5M1 here in Washington, and we'll give a very brief update on that. Um, so yeah, I should introduce myself first. I'm Katie Heyman. I'm a wildlife veterinarian with the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. Um, I focus entirely on, well, mostly on non-game species, so things that are not hunted, um, though because of High path AI. I do also work a lot with waterfowl, which clearly are a game species. But I'm the the agency lead for highly pathogenic avian influenza in Washington State. So I just want to start. I kind of always start with this slide when I talk about H5N1 now, um, because I think it's really important to re, uh, reiterate to folks, and, and many of you probably already know this, but the the current strain of H5N1, which is 2.3.44b is really considered an emerging threat for, for wild birds. It is very different than previous strains of highly pathogenic avian influenza that have um, hit North America over you know, the last hundred years. There have been several outbreaks of HPA AI in mostly in domestics. It was 2014-15 when we had our first cases in wild birds. And then um, the most recent outbreak of H5N1, again, is, is really different. And what's, um, what's reviewed here in the schematic is Pretty much how historically how high path AI would work. So we all know that, that waterfowl tend to be the natural reservoir for avian influenza viruses. They have um, low path varieties basically that circulate within the waterfowl, don't really cause much by way of disease. Um, those AI viruses can spill into domestic birds um, and it's in the domestic birds where they typically would mutate to become highly pathogenic and cause significant mortality. Um, high path AI is a foreign animal disease here in the United States. It's considered a select agent and has significant agricultural implications. And historically, we rarely saw high, um, high path AI spill back into wild birds. Um, this is not the case anymore. H5N1 2.3.4.4b is um, certainly circulating in wild birds and causing 
significant mortality in, in many species of, of wild birds, and especially seabirds. Um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the events that are ongoing down in, in South America, in Chile and Argentina, and more recently in um, South Georgia. So here in Washington, we had our first case of H5N1, the Eura Eurasian strain 2.3.44b, in March of 2022 in a greater white fronted goose. And since then, uh, the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife has been monitoring reports of sick and, and dead birds. We work really, really closely with wildlife rehabilitators here in Washington um, to kind of be the boots on the ground and help us keep track of where suspect cases are, as well as our um, district wildlife biologists. And we do submit a lot of um, a lot of cases for, for testing to confirm it as high path AI. And with, within this framework, um, we have regular coordination calls with our state and federal partners, again, because high path AI is a foreign animal disease. Um, the USDA has authority over, um, over it federally, and then the State Department of Ag's um, agriculture with uh, domestic birds, and then WDFW comes in, um, obviously, on the, the wildlife side. Um, this is out of date because in the last couple of days, um, high path AI is certainly increasing significantly on the landscape um, here in Washington, but this is just a, a you know, showing that, you know, what we have confirmed H5N1 here in Washington um, and quite a number of, of species, as you can see, several mammals, a raccoon, a bobcat, um, harbor seals, which will be the focus of the rest, most of this talk. Um, we're now up to, I think, whoops, 116 confirmed cases of H5N1. Um, the, the largest event that we've had so far in Washington is with the Caspian Terns, which I'll speak about in a minute, uh, where we lost, you know, over 1,600 of, of a breeding colony of Caspian Terns. And so this is where we really segue into high path AI H5N1 in our marine environment here in Washington. Prior to this outbreak in Caspian Terns on Rat Island, um, we had had a handful of cases here and there of like a bufflehead or, um, you know, some of the sea, sea ducks uh, had tested positive for H5N1, but they were, you know, single events. It wasn't a big mortality event, which included hundreds or thousands of, of animals. So for those of you that are not familiar with the Washington coast, this may not mean very much to you, um, but Marisol Island in Jefferson County is, um, it, it's in Jefferson County. It's it's in it's in the you know basically northern uh, Puget Sound. Fort Flagler is a very large state park. You can see campgrounds here, and these beaches um, are widely heavily used in the summertime. This Rat Island is this kind of sandy sandy spit, and at very low tides, it's connected. Um, you, you can walk across um, the the area here. And Indian Island is controlled by the by the military. It's not accessible by the general public at all. And so we were, you know, in some ways quite lucky when the Caspian term mortality event began, um, because there is a docent program which sits on the spit here um, of Fort Flagler State Park to try and minimize the human um, humans and their dogs from walking across over onto Rat Island to minimize the disturbance to the, the nesting seabirds. And so because of their presence, they saw the sick and dead. Caspian turns in, in mid-July and reported it to WDFW and we were able to respond um, that, that same day. Um, Scott Pearson happened to be out doing work on Protection Island and so was able to swing by and pick up a carcass or two that we were then able to um, submit for com confirmation and testing. Um, and so we you know, pretty much quickly determined that H5N1 was the culprit of the mortality events. We did significant carcass removal on Rat Island uh, for a variety of reasons, um, human human health concerns and proximity to the public campgrounds and human use of the beaches was a really big one. But we are also hoping to minimize the transmission of H5N1 to harbor seals because there's a, a pretty decent haul out um, along the, the beach of Rat Island. And if you, you know, the, the turn colony would be like basically right back here. Um, and so we're really trying to minimize the transmission from, from the, the Caspian turns to, to the harbor seals. And so Casey was able to do an aerial survey um, on July 17th, which is the first day that we went out to collect carcasses of Caspian turns. And with that, we were able to get a, a count of the harbor seals hauled out 
of um, you know non pups or adults versus pups on the beach. And I just want to highlight that the number of pups here is really pretty low, primarily because you know they hadn't fully started pupping at that point. Um, and and then the number of dead animals reported and responded to through the um, Port Townsend Marine Science Stranding Network and, and Diana Lambert helping collect those um, carcasses and do necropsies and our partners at um, the Center Valley Animal Rescue as well were also instrumental in helping do this. And so with this, we, we did find uh, five total animals were confirmed to have H5N1 through the course of this outbreak. Um, the outbreak began July 11th, as far as we know, in the Caspian Turns. The first harbor seal that detected that we detected um, H5N1 stranded on July 15th. Interestingly, that seal was tested as negative because we initially relied on the neural um, nasal pharyngeal swabs, um, and that swab was was negative by PCR for avian influenza. Um, as the summer progressed and the marine um, mammal stranding network basically was like we're you know this is more strandings than normal in this area we typically only see you know one maybe two strandings uh harbor seal strandings a year so the fact that we've gotten you know at the time it was like 12 or something like that um really made us go back and question whether or not the swabs were missing the detection of avian influenza so then we we submitted um, lung and brain as well and the lung and brain tested positive while the swab was negative. So at that point, we went back and um, submitted, resubmitted samples from some of the earlier cases and that July 15th case did uh, end up testing positive. So five total confirmed by NVSL. We did have, or NVSL is the National Veterinary Services Laboratory through the USDA who does all the confirmatory testing uh, for high path avian influenza. We do have a six, sixth animal that tested positive by the diagnostic the veterinary diagnostic lab at Washington State University, but was not confirmed by, by NVSL. So we can't technically count that one in the confirmed positives. Um, but so, so we can just see that 16 total animals stranded in this time period, um, and five of those were confirmed to have H5N1. We can't determine whether or not the other um, 10 were associated with H5N1 and then that one that's not confirmed. Uh, this is a phylogenetic tree of H5N1, um, thanks to some molecular analyses done by the Washington Department of Health. These sequences are all available open source by uh, GISAID.org if you're interested in playing around with the phylogenetic tree of all avian influenza H5N1s across uh, globally, it's not just in Washington. But it's really interesting because it allows us to determine that the uh, Caspian turn outbreak from at Rad Island did in fact come from a turn in down in Oregon, uh, which we were we were suspecting because Oregon Caspian turns down in Oregon were observed to be dying from avian influenza prior to what we had in at Rad Island. But interestingly enough, it also lets us look at the genetic um, the genetics and the H five N one of the seals. Um, this is just two different tissues from the same animal, so it's not surprising that it's exactly the same. Interestingly enough, this is actually two, two different animals. One animal has uh, the 744-001 and 002. It's just two different tissue types, um, but this animal is a, a different animal. So two animals with the exact same um, strains, wrong word, but the exact same uh, H5N1 type. And basically these, you know, there's just one or two base pair mutations between all of these branches in this tree, uh, which is really common because uh, flu viruses in general mutate really quite rapidly. And so it's really, um, really common to see very small changes in the virus itself as it passes from host to host. Um, but we can basically, based on the molecular epidemiology, we can say that um, it was direct transmission from the Caspian turns to the harbor seals at Rat Island, and there is not any evidence of seal to seal transmission of the virus based on, on the molecular epidemiology. I just wanted to put this up as a couple of really great resources if folks are interested in, in um, doing some, some more digging on H5N1 and wild birds and also marine mammals, um, especially down in, in South America. Um, and I'm happy to share stick these links in the chat um, as well if folks want them. And I think with that, I can stop and take questions. Great, thanks, Katie. We can have time for a couple questions. 
you want to raise your hand or unmute or put them into chat. I believe Katie has to jump off at 1030. <laughs> so. Hi, Katie. I'd like to ask a question. I can't find out where to raise my hand. You're good. Um, <laughs> I'm, so I'm interested for you to say that you're not seeing transmission between seals during the mm -hmm. to right. Uh, they're getting it directly from birds. Mm -hmm. And you know what the mechanism is? Are they birds getting in the face and they're breathing it in or from feces or what do you think it is? Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, as far as, and I brought this back up just so let me screen share it again so we can review it some more. That is, so our, based on our understanding of um, transmission dynamics of avian influenza, it is fecal oral. So the, the birds are probably defecating um, and then the seals are just being exposed to the virus and the feces from the bird. Um, there were also you know, thousand, you know, we picked up 1600 Caspian turn carcasses. And so the, the beach was littered with carcasses. And so I think direct exposure from a carcass to a seal is also possible. Um, obviously, I don't think the seals were ingesting the carcasses, they were just exposed and then maybe grooming themselves or getting the virus that way. Um, the reason why I said that there's really not strong evidence of seal to seal transmission is basically because the the genetic difference between these animals, right? So there is possibil a possibility in talking to the Department of Health folks as well. We can't with this, this um, node here representing two different animals, we can't be 100% certain that one of these seals didn't transmit it directly to the other seal because it's the same exact genetic signature. Um, but it's also entirely possible that two seals, you know, next to each other were exposed to the same um, pile of feces from a, a dead turn um, or a turn that had died from AI. Um, but what makes us think it wasn't seal to seal transmission is just this genetic difference between the three animals, if that makes sense. Um, so yeah, and I think the other reason that we were thinking that there's no direct transmission is because we only had the five confirmed cases, given the number of animals on the beach hauled out together. I suspect if there was seal to seal transmission, we would have had more mortality um, from this outbreak um, versus the point source transmission from the birds. Good. And to make one comment, so I'm currently on the Galapagos Islands and, and the avian flu has arrived here. It mm -hmm. appears to arrive with the frigate birds and mm -hmm. there's, they're starting to close rookeries and, and colonies from tourists to go see them. They're collecting birds once a week. And there's real concern it's going to spread to the sea lion population, which is already endangered. Mm -hmm. And so I think what you're doing there is going to help others anticipate and maybe plan even uh, what to do. But it's a huge concern here in the Galapagos. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's horrible news. Thanks, Andrew, for your question. And thanks, Katie, for coming uh, short notice and providing this really informative update. Um, like we mentioned at the beginning, Katie, as well as others, will be speaking um, at the Marine Birds work group meeting tomorrow. And I'll share that link out again. But it will be tomorrow, Wednesday, from 10 to 12 p.m. for a deeper dive on this topic, as well as discussion on field safety protocols. So thanks again, Katie, for your time. Yeah, thank you for having me. And thanks, everyone. Wonderful. All right. So with that, I think we can move on to our, our next agenda item, which is uh, just a breakout room, a chance for you all to, to talk to each other. Um, you'll be randomly assigned into a breakout room of about uh, with about three to four participants per room. And the prompt we're providing is what was a highlight from your 2023 summer field season. So I'm gonna create this room in a moment. Um, and oh, thanks Katie for putting the, the links in the chat. We'll make sure to put those in the meeting summary as well. All right. All right, so if unless there's any questions, We'll, we'll kick off the breakout room. All right, I don't see any questions, so 
We'll be back in about five minutes, uh, five to six minutes. All right. Thanks, everyone. All right. Welcome back, everyone. Hopefully that was enough time to hear from everyone in your group. I was just saying if there was anything particularly exciting um, that you want to share with the full uh, work group, feel free to pop it into the chat. Um, and we'll make sure to include that in the meeting summary that goes out. Okay, and with that, we're moving right along here um, on our agenda. We're going to be dedicating the next um, 50 minutes or so to lightning talks. So these are updates from Marine Mammal Workgroup members um, on various uh, project monitoring results, activities, publications, etc. since our last meeting. And the first one will be a presentation from Cindy Elizer um, on harbor porpoise aggregations. Cindy wasn't able to join us uh, today, but provided a pre recorded presentation. So I'm going to share my screen with sound. And fingers crossed that this, this works perfectly. Um, but let me know if you aren't able to hear. I'm going to share it. Hi, I'm Dr. Cindy Elliser, and thank you for uh, letting me speak virtually. I'm sorry I couldn't be at the meeting this week, uh, but I'm going to be talking about harbor porpoise aggregations in the Salish Sea um, with the, my co-authors, Dave Anderson, Lori Schuster, Katrina McKeever, Aaron Johns Glass, Johannes Krieger, and Anna Hall. And the paper is open access, uh, you can see at the link below. Um, so we know very little about harbor porpoise social structure and social behaviors in general. Um, but we do know that they are generally found in small groups of less than threes oh and having solitary animals is not uncommon and this is true throughout their global range. However, there are times where these animals meet in these larger groupings um, and some of these seem to be anecdotal in nature um, that seemingly more rare, um, but they do occur. Uh, and these can either be densely packed in a small area or um, these smaller groups that are in proximity spread over several kilometers. They can last few hours to up to days, weeks, and even months in some locations. Where we see these in other places around the world, they think it's likely well, it's about the it's seasonal about fluctuations it. in areas where the species migrates. So they're migrating in and out between the seasons. However, in the Salish Sea, they are not known to migrate um, and they, these um, larger aggregations are thought to be rare and are likely feeding aggregations in areas of dense prey. So we really wanted to look into that data and see are these actually rare because we've been we've been seeing and hearing from other groups and people uh, that they see them a fair amount, right? So we looked at uh, data collected on both boat and land uh, from February 2017 to March 2023. We used a, a variety of, of data collection um, research groups through dedicated surveys. Um, and uh, so Cascadia Research Collective, uh, Pacific Mammal Research, and CD Marine Sciences in BC. So we have a, a, a transboundary approach here. So looking at not just our on side of the US. Mm -hmm. So we use research group data. Um, we, wa we did whale watch and naturalists. Uh, so most of the time, harbor porpoises are not high on their list of recording. But we asked them specifically to say, can you log on their, on their private sighting app um, groups of 10 or more? because we were interested in, in seeing how common these were, and they were happy to oblige. So we got a lot of great data from that community. We also um, use citizen and community science uh, data from a, a, a um, public sighting app that we created at PACMAM in March 2021. And also there were reports from residents, uh, community scientists, and uh, fishers that were given to uh, Cascadia Research Collective. So by combining all of those, we gained a lot more data than we would have just from our dedicated research um, uh, data collection. So we looked at groups that had 20 or more individuals, uh, and then we analyzed the frequency of behaviors between small and large groups to see, you know, what was happening different. Uh, we used a subset of the data because uh, that required more diligent uh, recording of behaviors, as well as um, longer term um, consistent data collection to look at those. Uh, so we used the Cascadia Research, Co Research Collective and PACMAM data for that subset. So we define the short-term ones as lasting for a few hours or up to a few days at most, and long-term ones that are remaining in the same area lasting at least one week, and they're documented by observers over multiple days, 
um, under good siting conditions with few gaps of just uh, more than a few days. So they're really, they're pretty consistently in that area. So straight to the data, um, we are found that they are more common than previously thought. They are certainly not rare. Uh, there were over 100, uh, there were 160 aggregations in 2022 alone. And this is likely an underrepresentation of the actual occurrence because we can't be out there all the time. They are seen year round. You can see, we see them in every month um, and some with over a hundred individuals and some up to two, 300, up to even 500, I think I, I saw with one. Um, so these lo really large aggregations are not uncommon. Um, they're, so they, they do seem, seem to happen a, a fair bit. Um, summer, we did see an increase in the number of uh, occurrences, but that is likely at least somewhat due to effort because everybody's out in the summer more. Researchers, whale watch boats, and public combined. Um, we found that looking at the difference between the large and small groups, that social behavior and other more quote unquote uncommon behaviors like vessel approach or fission, uh, fusion as the groupings are coming together in a way, um, and more social splashing and things like that are seen more often during these large aggregations than in short uh, um, small groups. Uh, for example, one aggregation had over 40 mating attempts, and that was recorded by an experienced observer. And to put that in comparison, in small groups, we'll see one mating attempt, maybe two. Uh, certainly not 40. So we found that these are more common than previously thought. Um, it's likely that because the harbor porpoises are increasing in recent years, they're just they are more ability to have these larger groupings because there are more animals. But it's also likely that it's not necessarily increasing, you know, outside of that, because it's partly part of their their social structure. We just haven't been looking at it, right? We have not been paying attention to harbor porpoises as much until more recent years. So and something to keep in mind. Foraging behaviors on top of social ones where foraging is very common during these aggregations. So it is very likely that that is an important part of it. Um, they do need consistent food sources. So um, it's important for them to be able to, to uh, grab that food when they need it. Uh, the large aggregations, we, it's a good thing to think about that they must have a, a vast food, um, a vast amount of food to sustain these large groupings of you know hundreds of individuals over long periods of time. So just food for thought and how we're looking at um, where and when these guys are hanging out. So they also like to party. They got to get together, even if they're more solitary in nature, they do need to um, interact with each other to do things they need to do to keep the next generation going. So um, we're, we saw that it was over two times as likely to see social behaviors in these larger groupings. Um, and so this provides those opportunities for these more solitary species, um, the interaction that they need to be able to have those behaviors and create their, um, maintain their communities. So we saw a uh, wave and wake riding, although we do see that in small groups as well. It was more common in these larger groupings. Vessel approach, they don't seem to be as scared of boats as they are in other locations around the world. Um, and of course, mating, as I talked about before. I, I, this is from a small group encounter, but it's one I got a couple weeks ago, which is very exciting. Um, but this is, is time for them to get together and uh, test out their, uh, their abilities to create the next generation. So in the, in the end, um, one thing I wanted to emphasize about this research is the transboundary approach that we collected data. We had data in there from BC and US. So we're looking at the whole group um, and where it's occurring in the community, um, in the Sailor Sea. Uh, the Whale Watch and community scientists provide data. A large amount of our data came from that Whale Watch community because they're out there all the time seeing what's happening out there. And so this is really helpful for us to get a more complete look about what's happening. Um, the large aggregations are more common than previously thought, are likely very important foraging and socializing time for this species, really important for those quote unquote solitary guys. Um, and so understanding these aggregations can help us understand their foraging ecology, their behavioral ecology, and the social structure of the species that likes to keep us on our toes. Thanks again so much, and I'm sorry I couldn't be there today. All right. So although Cindy isn't um, present to answer questions, um, if you do have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat or, or email Cindy or myself and we'll get those over to her. I also, um, in my introduction of this agenda item, just failed to mention that we did provide two prompts for presenters that were optional to address. So I just wanted to highlight those, which was how can or does this work influence policy and management decisions? And how do you see climate change impacting conditions? Are there any observed correlations? So 
when we get to the Q&A session, maybe those will come up. All right, and with that, I'm going to hand it off to Ryan Walsh from the MACA Fisheries Management Team to present on scarring analysis on Pacific Coast Feeding Group gray whales in Northwest Washington. Hi everyone, hopefully you can see my screen and hear me. Uh, I'm Ryan Walsh. I, I'm an employee for the Macaw Fisheries Management Marine Mammal Program. Uh, today, I have the opportunity to share our work that we conducted on anthropogenic and killer whale scarring for Pacific Coast Feeding Group gray whales. We had two main objectives of this research. Uh, the first being to report the observed scarring rates for Pacific Coast Feeding Group gray whales off Northwest Washington from 2014 through 2020, and to analyze these scarring rates uh, both by sex of whales and by the anatomical body regions of gray whales. And our second uh, obje objective for the study was to compare our observed rates for scarring for Pacific Coast Feeding Group gray whales to those observed from previous studies in Sockland Island gray whales. And those previous studies were conducted by Amanda Bradford and David Weller. There are three scar sources that we analyzed in our study. The first being vessel strike scars, uh, which is shown in the top left image, killer whale predation shown in the middle image, and entanglement scars shown in the top right photo. In the interest of time, I'll jump right into the results of our study. Uh, this graph shows the overall frequency of each of the scar sources, entanglement, vessel strike, and killer whale, broken down by the sex of, uh, of whales. So um, overall, there were 139 whales that we observed throughout our study, and 16 of those whales, roughly 11% of whales, um, had evidence of entanglement scars. Whereas 5% or five whales, roughly 4% of whales, uh, had vessel strike scars. And then 36%, or sorry, 36 whales, uh, which is roughly a quarter of the whales uh, that we observed in our study, had killer whale scars. And there was no significant difference uh, between male and female gray whales uh, for any one of the scar sources in our study. This um, overall frequency of scarring doesn't show the whole picture as uh, photographic coverage of each of the body regions that we assessed was disproportionately uh, represented. So we then took these overall frequencies and broke them down by uh, various body regions. We had 23 uh, total body regions that we as assigned um, throughout our study. And this graph here represents, um, it takes into account the proportion of whales that were um, observed uh, with photographic coverage for, uh, for the whales in this study. So um, there's, there's a lot of information in this graph, but I want to just highlight that for, in, for vessel strikes, body regions five, and body region six, uh, that's the region between the, the cranium and the dorsal hump. Um, these regions were most likely to, to be, um, to show signs of vessel strike scars. Body regions 10 and 11, which make up the posterior caudal peduncle, were most likely to have signs of entanglement. And then body regions 12, in body region 14, uh, the tips of the fluke blades were most frequently observed with killer whale rates. To jump into our second objective of our study, comparison of Pacific Coast feeding group gray whales and Sockland Island gray whales, uh, we saw no observed differences between the scarring rates of uh, the two regions uh, for entanglement and vessel strike scars. However, when we look at killer whale scars, Sockland Island gray whales were more likely to uh, be scarred from killer whale than uh, Pacific Coast Feeding Group gray whales. The main takeaways of the study uh, were that there was no significant difference between male and female Pacific Coast Feeding Group gray whales by scar source. 
and that scarring rates that we report in this study are likely biased low due to poor photographic coverage of body regions uh, that had high rates of entanglement in killer whale scars in particular. In fact, if we restricted our analysis of entanglement rates to uh, the caudal peduncle alone, we would have reported a entanglement rate of 18.6%, which is much greater than the 11% uh, that we report for all whales in this study. The killer whale attacks uh, were 2.2 times as likely in Sockland Island gray whales as compared to Pacific Coast feeding group gray whales. And this is most likely uh, due to the fact that Sockland Island gray whales pass through more killer whale hotspots uh, than Pacific Coast feeding group gray whales that have a shorter mi migratory route. And then lastly, there's no significant difference in anthropogenic scarring sources between Sockland Island and Pacific Coast feeding group gray whales, showing that human interactions with whales in both regions is similar. There's many people that I'd like to thank uh, for their contributions to this study, but I'll just highlight uh, my co-authors, Jonathan Scordino, Liz Allen, and uh, our reviewers, Amanda Bradford, Stephanie Norman, and Rafaela Stimmelmeyer. Um, and I'd be happy to take any questions when it's time. Thank you very much for letting me present. Thank you so much, Ryan. Yeah, so keep those questions in mind. You can also put them into chat, but we'll uh, pause for Q&A following John John's presentation um, on Sounder Gray Whale Research Updates. So with that, I'll hand it over to you, John. You should be able to share your screen. Great, we can see it. Perfect, thanks. Um, and I probably have too many slides, so I'll be going very quickly to just give an update uh, on Sounders and some of the things related to them. Um, this work does involve a number of collaborators, both the uh, other people and groups that are involved. Um, and just for a refresher, the Sounders are um, a small group of whales that we've given that name to. Uh, they're part of the overall Eastern North Pacific gray whale population that migrates uh, uh, mostly past Washington. Uh, but these are animals that stop off and use this area in the inset uh, around uh, the south end of Whidbey Island and Kamano Island. And it's a regular group of animals. And it is also distinct and separate from uh, the Pacific Coast feeding group that Ryan was just talking about, for example, that more used Pacific Northwest waters from uh, you know spring, summer, fall. The sounders primarily use their area in spring and then most of them that migrate on, presumably up to Arctic waters. So just to keep track of that, uh, four groups of gray whales, uh, overall Eastern North Pacific group migrating past, the sounders that make the stop off, Pacific Coast feeding group that come and feed through the spring, summer, and fall, and then the Western gray whales that Ryan also uh, referred to uh, that also pass by Washington State, it turns out. Uh, the sounders primarily feed on ghost shrimp. Um, uh, feeding in the intertidal zone. We've documented this going back to 1990. Um, uh, they leave these visible pits that are visible at low tide in areas that they feed and access at high tide when there's just you know 10 to 10 feet of water in the area. Some of them we've tracked now for over 30 years. Uh, their feeding behavior we've documented with tags this is a summary of one of our longer tag durations uh, back from 2016 that showed uh, the feeding events, which are uh, uh, most distinguished by this role that you see in the middle panel. So this is a feeding event, feeding event, feeding event, feeding event over a, a 37 hour time period. These feeding events are occurring with the whales diving to extremely shallow depths shown in the top panel and these coincide with these high tide periods, primarily the rising tide and high tide. Uh, in addition to our documenting the sounders, which I'll talk about over years, uh, we're excited that there are a number of collaborative projects that have come out of this. Uh, this includes uh, Hannah Clayton is doing her PhD program at Stanford, focusing on the energetics and feeding of the sounders gray whale along with local behavior. 
Um, we've periodically been doing these deployments of suction cup tags, including recent video tag deployments, collaborating with uh, Ocean Alliance on the video drone, the drone-based deployments of those tags. Uh, we have had a project that Alex uh, Pavlinovich has been doing. Uh, he originally did it as master's program and now trying to publish on vessel interactions with the sounders. Uh, we work extensively, and I'll present uh, some of the results from the work with John Durbin and Holly Fernbaugh on health assessment. There's also another project on health assessment uh, that Kira Telford is doing her master's project on using vessel-based photographs. Um, and then we also have a project uh, sponsored by NOAA we're involved with, with redefining these biologically important areas, and I'll speak to that briefly as well. Uh, the long-term history of the sounders, this is what we keep building on or adding on. These are individuals as rows, years as columns going now through 2023. Green or some color indicates the uh, whale was sighted that year. Uh, a blank means it wasn't sighted that year. In these early years, some of these blanks are strictly due to the fact we didn't have much effort, sometimes just one survey in a year. Our survey efforts become more consistent and it's expanded with citizen science and whale watch operations. Uh, but you can definitely see the trend of uh, an original six whales documented in 1990-91, another six whales that joined in 1999-2000 period, and then we've had another eight or so whales that have joined um, in 2019 through 2021, 2018 through 2021. In some cases, we've documented these whales as being pregnant uh, uh, either through UAS or a project that uh, uh, Anna Bachman was doing matching to the Mexico breeding lagoons that documented that some of these animals, uh, particularly this whale, Earhart, uh, was pregnant in years before she wasn't seen uh, as a sounder indicating at least the few females we have that we occasionally don't see likely are uh, animals that uh, have a calf and don't show up with that calf. Um, uh, I will point out that in recent years, especially with the unusual mortality event that was declared for gray whales in 2019, uh, we have seen not just an increased number of gray whales, but also an expanded seasonality of some of the whales. At least two of the long-term sounders uh, over winter spent the winter instead of going down to Mexico feeding in the Northern Puget Sound area in both the 22 and 2023 seasons uh, cited earlier. Uh, and uh, at least one of our new sounders actually was documented for well over a year feeding continuously in the area. So that seasonal picture sort of expanded a little bit. Uh, these whales have had remarkable survival. Uh, we've only had two of our long-term individuals only recently kind of disappear and presumably die uh, despite large-scale mortality events in the overall population. The sounders have done remarkably well, but we have lost two of these long-term individuals. Um, I'll just point out that the, maybe I'll focus on this right panel, the years we had new sounders, like uh, the shown in these gray bars uh, and the scale on the right match up well with the years of increased stranding numbers of gray whales. So if you look at our long-term gray whale stranding record in Washington state, you see three primary periods of highest gray whale mortality. Uh, these two line up with the unusual mortality events that were declared in those periods. The next highest year was this 1990-91 uh, period, which was the original kind of uh, initial sounders showing up, that was elevated mortality. That also seems to line up really well with the population trend of the Eastern North Pacific gray whale. A recent publication in Science uh, uh, led by Josh Stewart showed three main periods of decline in the abundance estimates that line up with these higher mortality events and also line up with now when new sounders came to our area. And so these were uh, animals probably seeking uh, alternative food sources uh, to the Arctic. I'm going to skip this. I'm going to jump through just the drone stuff uh, on body condition that John and Holly have been doing has continued for a number of years. We now have uh, four years of data um, getting multiple measurements of the body condition of these whales, both within season 
between years, uh, uh, as well as comparison among individuals. All of these one shaded areas indicates when they were able to get good body condition assessments of those individuals. Uh, these have shown these whales gain weight rapidly. Most of them do really well. Changing body condition, this is the same whale in February versus April, and you can just visually see the dramatic change in body condition. And over the years, you know, this is now the, a long-term time series, you know, on one of the individuals, uh, one of our early individuals, Shackleton, uh, looking at body condition across years. Uh, this has also been useful to, even though it's early in the pregnancy, assign pregnancy of a, at least two of the female individuals based on their being girthier further back along the body than is typical for other gray whales. Uh, let's see, I think I'll just jump over this just to get to other things. I mentioned uh, uh, working on an alternate measure of body condition. This is still being tested and compared uh, using kind of the body contour behind the blowhole that Kira Telford's been working on. Uh, we've continued our tag deployments and we had our best year yet in 2023. We deployed 11 tags. Uh, Four of them, the traditional way with a, a boat uh, and a pole, uh, but we also did have the first uh, UAS deployments working with Ocean Alliance. Uh, and, uh, and this is uh, the video taken from the drone of one of those deployments. We are very happy with how this went uh, and just basically dropping the tags you know, on the back of the whale uh, worked quite well. It allowed us for the first time to deploy tags on multiple animals in the same group, something that is hard to do with boat approaches. And these are actually three whales, all three of them tagged, and that had some value in comparing detection of vocalizations and the signing vocalizations to particular tagged animals. Uh, this is something I mentioned Hannah Clayton has been doing some work uh, both on uh, her long-term PhD project on feeding and energetics, but she also just had a publication come out on some of the early work uh, she did looking at uh, especially acoustic behavior of blue whales using some of the tag data and deployed tags. And that's now out in frontiers and marine science and just came out in July. Uh, I mentioned we're revising these biologically important areas. That includes assigning that for the uh, Sounders gray whales here, but we also assigned it based on the PCFG whales and define new migratory corridors. This should come out in the next about three or four months in frontiers and marine science. Uh, we are continuing our monitor of the PCFG whales. And I think the main point I would just conclude on is that uh, um, uh, that, uh, you know, 20, the main conclusions related to the UME is we've seen this expanded use of the sounders areas during the UME. Uh, some of those whales, sounders whales, have become new sounders and returned. The sounders whales have survived really well, though we have had a few that have died. Uh, and uh, we really look forward to this new long-term data set on health assessments to assign uh, things. I will point out also that the UME uh, pattern does not seem to have had the same effect on the, on the uh, PCFG whales as well. Okay, I'll stop there. I think I'm at my past my eight minutes, so thank you. Thank you, John. Okay, with that, we can pause here for questions from members on Ryan's presentation or John's before we move on to some other presentations from members. Andrew. Yeah, I'd like to ask uh, Ryan a question just about the scarring. Could you assess how fresh those scars were or for how many years they've been carrying the scars? So for example, the killer whale scars, is this something you could see indications of recent or they had perhaps an encounter when they were much younger? What's your um, sense? Yeah, we didn't um, look at that in our study, but we definitely were able to see um, scar progression throughout the, the six, seven years in our study. Um, some killer whale scars were observed first to uh, kind of have like a bluish tint to them, which we interpreted as um, newer, fresher, uh, more recent scars. And over time, they would 
turn bright white and then kind of lose that coloration um, over time. And yeah, the, the scar progression is really interesting. I think um, potentially a longer term study we would be able to uh, to analyze scar pro progression and also acquisition of new scars. Thanks. Ryan, I don't know if you're continuing your work, but uh, even though the sample size isn't great, we have tend to have very good photographic and drone-based documentation. Uh, any thought about uh, looking at the sounders as uh, another comparison group uh, to your comparison of, you know, PCFG and, you know, Western gray whales, for example? Yeah, that sounds, uh, that, that would definitely be something that I'm open to. And yeah. adding to that, data set uh, with a greater sample size would be an interesting comparison. Maybe I could ask a question to John. Looking ahead, do you have a sense of what the carrying capacity is for the sounders? How, how many can you have there? You seem to be adding to the number each year. Yeah. No, I think that's going to be a perfect uh, uh, element of Hannah's work. And Hannah's on, I don't know if you want to uh, uh, take a swing at that. We're obviously excited about that. It was looked at before in a couple of, uh, you know, when DNR did a study trying to uh, assess overall ghost shrimp biomass and what portion, mm -hmm. uh, because uh, we're being uh, fed on by Sounders gray whales in comparison also to the small human uh, commercial harvest there is. But Hannah, anything you want to add to that? No, I think the short answer is we don't we don't know right now. But what I'm doing is sampling um, each month uh, several different locations within the, the northern Puget Sound to try to get an idea of what the density and distribution is, and uh, link that back to individual rates of consumption from gray whales. So hopefully, hopefully in like five years, I can answer that. Santa. Well, please, if there's any other questions, put them in the chat. We'll, we'll also have another pause for Q&A after our next three presenters. So if there's anything that comes to mind, feel free to ask um, the questions of Ryan and John again. But in the interest of time, we'll we'll move on to, to Caitlin from Maritime Blue, uh, who's presenting on quiet sound updates. And thanks, Ryan and John and Cindy again for your wonderful presentations. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes. Yes. All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Caitlin O'Moro. I am a Quiet Sound, a senior program manager here at the nonprofit Washington Maritime Blue. Uh, today, I'll give you a quick, quick update on some of the main projects um, that we've been working on over the past year or so. So Quiet Sound is a collaborative non-regulatory program reducing the impacts to Southern resident killer whales from large commercial vessels. And again, we are housed in the nonprofit Washington Maritime Blue. Uh, at the bottom of the slide here are the logos of our funders for this fiscal year. So underwater noise, we know that that is uh, underwater noise and disturbance from large vessels is one of the main three threat areas identified for the Southern resident killer whales. What you see here is kind of a heat map of vessel transits of our large commercial vessels going in and out of Washington state and Canadian waters to the major ports and then out into the ocean. We like to show this because it illustrates that our vessels uh, and their paths directly overlap with the critical habitat of Southern resident killer whales, which is the majority of the inland of Washington waters and out on the coast as well. So the whales and the vessels share very narrow passageways. And one of the things that Quiet Sound, the main thing that Quiet Sound is trying to do is to help make the waters safer for the whales where these vessels are as well. Uh, and we do this through a collaborative process. So what you see here are the logos of the members of our leadership committee for Quiet Sound. We have representation uh, from the federal government, state, 
tribal governance from the Macaw tribe and representation from the Northwest Indian Fisheries Commission. Um, we have ports, we have a marine industry from the Marine Exchange of Puget Sound and Pacific Merchant Shipping Association, um, and also our conservation and research organizations from NRDC and Seattle Aquarium. And uh, this makes up the decision-making body of Quiet Sound um, to have all the stakeholders and um, partners who would be impacted by our programs at the table uh, to help direct the programming of Quiet Sound to um, move our goal forward. And uh, one of the main um, activities that we're engaging in at Quiet Sound is called a voluntary vessel slowdown. So we are currently uh, in the 2023-24 uh, seasonal voluntary vessel slowdown. It is happening right now. It started on October 12th, which was the first day that the Southern resident killer whales were spotted in the kind of South Sound uh, area this season. You'll see on the map, the outline in blue uh, is our slowdown area, which is a targeted space that was identified as a main foraging area for SRKW at this time of year. And we ask our large commercial vessels, which are our vehicle carriers, cruise ships, container vessels, bulkers, and tankers to voluntarily slow their speeds to those indicated on the slides while transiting through this area of about 22 nautical miles. We're also asking folks to turn off ultrasonic anti-fouling devices while transiting through SRKW habitat as um, the sound emitted by those devices are shown to um, overlap, overlap in similar ranges as vessel noise as well. So on a whole, what we're trying to do here is research has shown that when these large commercial vessels slow their speed, their underwater noise reduces. And we want to reduce the overlap of vessel underwater noise with the frequency ranges that SRKW use to echolocate and communicate while in their critical habitat. Um, so we are actively in a slowdown at this moment in time. Um, and last season, 2022-23, was what we called our trial slowdown. It was the first voluntary vessel slowdown in Washington state waters for SRKW. Some exciting, exciting results um, from that, 70% of vessels transiting through the area decreased their speed, and 53% of vessels achieved this proposed speed targets that I named in the slide before. And we celebrate any reduction in speed from these vessels as that equates to a reduction in noise. So overall, um, during the slowdown time as compared to after, there was a 2.8 uh, reduction in decibel, which equates to around 45% reduction in sound intensity for that space. The underwater noise levels were reduced in the frequency ranges that SRKW use, and SRKW were present for about 45% of the time that the slowdown was on last year. You can go to our website, quietsound.org, uh, to review the full uh, report of last season's slowdown. And then some initial results and a fun new photo. Um, thanks, Donna and Orca Network. Uh, for the first two weeks of this current slowdown season, uh, we have 79% of vessels slowing while transiting through the area and 72% meeting the speed targets. And these are really exciting numbers for the first uh, one and two years of this slowdown program. Uh, one of the other things that we're working on is to bolster this system called the Whale Report Alert System, which sends uh, real-time location-specific whale alerts to approved commercial mariners so that they can take evasive action when safe and feasible to do so with their vessels when near a whale, specifically an SRKW. Um, and we are in the final, final stages. Thank you so much to Orca Network, uh, Karsha Data Cooperative, OceanWise, um, for pushing forward to connect our robust Washington State sightings networks to this existing system that's based in Canada. What you see here is a screenshot I took yesterday. Those black circles are um, sightings of SRKW that was put in by Orca Network into this um, space, which is delivering more information to our mariners uh, right now. So we're in the final stages of kind of wrapping up this really exciting development. So thanks all for that. And then upcoming um, is what we are calling a hydrophone feasibility study. This is funded by the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, 
Um, and Quiet Sound's goal for this is to gain an understanding of the feasibility of connecting existing Washington State hydrophones to this RAS system that I mentioned in the last slide. We know that whales exist at night and in the fog when it's hard for humans to see them. And we know that there are hydrophones that exist in Washington right now. So we uh, want to know how we can best connect those things to give mariners more information to make more informed choices while on the water to reduce their threats. If you have any immediate thoughts or suggestions for me about our very beginning stages of this work, feel free to shoot me an email at caitlin at maritimeblue.org. You can also message me in the chat. And then very quickly, um, Nicole asked me to think about some of the things that related to the Marine Mammal Work Group work plan objectives. One of the questions being, um, how does this work influence policy and management decisions? Um, and I think that Quiet Sound is the management decision. I think that there was um, a lot of research work that went into um, creating the recommendations of the uh, ORCA task force in 2019, which directly resulted in the creation and operation of Quiet Sound, which is putting in on water management programs as we speak. Um, and how do we see climate change impacting conditions for our programming? Are there any observed correlations? We know that climate change um, is impacting the whales and their ecosystem and will continue to do so. I think one thing that's interesting about the maritime industry, specifically with large commercial vessels, is that folks are starting to uh, really get excited, getting excited about reducing greenhouse gas emissions via large commercial vessels slowing down. And the co-benefits of ships that slow down reduce their underwater noise while also reducing their greenhouse gas emissions. So I think there's some really exciting things management wise to help combat climate change as far as on water initiatives are concerned. And that's what I've got. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Caitlin. So keep your questions in mind that have come up during that presentation. We'll pause at the end of the next two. So with that, Scott. Scott will be presenting on Acoustic Orca Sound Hydrophone Network update. Thanks, Nicole, and thanks, Caitlin. That's a perfect segue into my, my talk. Um, so I am want to mostly talk about Orca Sound. Um, are you seeing a map of some green markers? We are. Yeah, so in the last year, I, uh, we've sort of expanded uh, after a couple of years of preparation from three locations to um, let's call it six and a half right now, uh, which I'm showing you on this map. I, I hope I'll get a chance to just briefly talk about the ongoing collaborations over the same time period with our colleagues in British Columbia, uh, who have many more hydrophones in the water, as Caitlin alluded to, than we do. Um, and everything I've been, we'll talk about today is mostly inspired by the work of Orca Lab that started in the 1970s. I'm trying to make real-time listening possible, um, in part because of educational outreach benefits. Um, this is the work of my social purpose corporation here in Seattle called Beam Reach. Uh, my father is Val Beers. He is the only other employee of, of this small family business. And our purpose is to innovate uh, in pursuit of the recovery of the Southern residents and other, other marine life. Uh, all Everything I'm gonna show you in the next three minutes here is the work of tens, starting to be hundreds of volunteers, um, many of whom are highlighted in this Hacker Hall of Fame and have put months of their effort into the software that makes what I'm going to show you possible. I'll put links into all these um, tabs, but the main news I wanted to share is like last week, we after um, we're, we've launched Orca Sound version three, um, its main innovation is a map that you can actually zoom in and out on. So you can see the, the locations that we've been testing most intensely the last week here. Um, there's a, a, a placeholder for ways to learn to be a better listener. But the other big innovation is that when you're listening to one of these sites live, uh, I need to hide this, remove this, you can play the sound live and then report what you're hearing as either a whale, a vessel, or something else, and you can make a comment about it. So I hear water sounds. And this is not just a website, a static website, it's a web, what we call a web application. So if I enter that and then go look at the reports, 
page here, you'll see, see oh, that's beta, sorry. That's what we were testing last week. So you'll see my comment and you can review that clip of water sounds that I just tagged. So that's now operational for the locations on the map um, in combination with um, AI, which Microsoft employees have built with us since uh, starting to collaborate with them in 2019. So at the same time, there's human detections coming in, there's AI detections coming in. And so I get a lot of email and I wanna invite anyone who would like to get these notifications to help me test the, what we'll call the moderator side of the system. Um, the AI is not super smart. Some of our listeners are much smarter than the AI, but um, in some cases for some end users like RAS, we need to be sure that, of what we're hearing. And so reaching some consensus before we issue a notification is an important step. So um, we've, uh, we've mostly been focusing on this corner of this diagram. Um, and the next thing we're building is an automation of these detections of acoustic events into a data cooperative that, um, that Caitlin mentioned. At the same time, Orca Network and other partners have been experimenting with ways to add sightings. Um, there's many other ways coming, I'm sure, and there's many other things that we can do uh, with these out outputs, particularly PSEMP as a marine monitoring group. Um, so I'll just say as a segue to Monica's talk that Akarsha can at any time show you like what the data density is for the last seven days. And there's an API that lets folks access this. So RAS's um, API exchange is one use of these data, but we're trying to build a number of other uses. For example, we have a draft layer in the default oil spill response app that NOAA prefers uh, spill responders to use. And you can see in this test layer that all the points from yesterday that Caitlin has uh, going out to commercial ships are also available to NOAA as a layer uh, sorted by species. So um, that's most of what I wanted to say. Uh, if you're interested in collaborating, I see huge potential for, you know, all this real-time information becomes archived uh, data that could be collab can combined with uh, longer historical archives, as well as environmental layers. So just as an example, Irma has a public, um, a, a bunch of public environmental layers that you can use to contextualize the sightings and hearings that are coming in through the cooperative. So this is an example of putting a few, um, gray whale sightings over some really nice bathymetry that came from the Puget Sound estuarine um, NOAA efforts. So I, th I think the, the future looks really bright in terms of um, sort of amplifying the utility of each of these data points that community scientists give us. I'll end just by saying that uh, the BC Hydrophone Network has locations across BC that hopefully will leverage some of this that we've built. Um, and we had a collaborative project with what, uh, this brand new web website called whalesound.ca to build um, a tool for looking at the archive data. Um, our hope this is in 2024 to make this something that we can do with our data. But as an example, here's data from SimRes based on, on Saturna as recently as uh, early October. So this visualization is what BeamReach co-sponsored with the BC Hydrophone Network to visualize sort of how the hydrophone station is doing generally, the daily detections of, in this case, humpbacks and orcas, the things that uh, the BC Hydrophone Network has worked the hardest on, viewing acoustic events um, diurnally and seasonally and tidally and with lunar phases to look for patterns. And down the line for us, but very soon for the Canadians are you know, presenting noise data from the same physical assets we have work so hard to maintain together in the water. So I'll put those links in and pass it back. Thanks. Thank you, Scott. And then the last presenter of the Lightning Talk series is Monica. Um, uh, she'll be presenting an update on orca sightings in the Salish Sea and Southern resident killer whale presence. Yeah, thank you. You seen my screen okay there? Yes. Perfect. 
Um, yeah, Monica Whelan Shields. I'm the director of the Orca Behavior Institute uh, based on San Juan Island. And we'll just give a brief update on what we're kind of seeing with Southern resident and big scholar whale trends uh, throughout the Salish Sea. So if you're not familiar with this aspect of what we do at OB, we're doing a daily tracking of all killer whales uh, throughout the Salish Sea from north to south and west as far out as um, Otter Point in the Strait of Juan Fuca. And um, we didn't set out to become um, a duplicate sightings network, but rather a source to help verify and collate reports from existing and emerging uh, public and community resources. And then to really help kind of um, get that information summarized and shared back to the public and to policymakers um, to help inform uh, those management efforts, because as we know, uh, both ecotypes are really um, changing their usage of the Salish Sea um, on a yearly basis. And so we really emphasize um, same day tracking and same day following up on reports. So especially making use of kind of the um, ab now abundant uh, regional community social media pages where folks who live and utilize the shorelines or are out on the water are taking high quality digital photos, um, sharing those and being able to, you know, ask for those photos, ask for additional photos and um, both, you know, verify and build this uh, data set of who's out there and who's utilizing the region and also really engaging the public in, in these types of tracking efforts. Um, so all Southern resident reports are confirmed by our team firsthand, either through uh, visual or acoustic documentation. And then because of the sheer quantity of uh, big scalar well reports, if we're not confirming those firsthand, we have kind of some uh, trusted and experienced observers, either from other research groups or some um, experienced uh, captains and naturalists on the water who we uh, take reliable IDs from. Um, if you haven't seen some of our maps, we produce these monthly and annual sightings maps for both southern resident and big killer whales. Uh, this is showing the, the annual results for both ecotypes from 2022, um, with each color indicating a different season uh, for bigs. Also, the, the size of the dot there is um, indicating group size. And so this is one of our public engagement tools that, that folks really you know, love seeing their sightings become. Uh, represented on this map where each dot is kind of indicating uh, a unique group of whales seen on a unique day. But then we're also taking this data and uh, summarizing it in um, some peer-reviewed publications, including one that came out earlier this year, summarizing the last five years of data on southern resident killer whale presence specifically. Um, this was looking at whale days as a unit. Um, you know, we, we spent time in the, in the workshops uh, earlier this year talking about what is a metric that makes sense. But for now, um, we're following on, on previous work that's been done looking at just number of days present within the Salish Sea waters. Um, there's a lot of data in this table here, and the paper delves into it a little more specifically, including by, by subregion and by season. Um, but what I'll just highlight right here is that uh, the decline that we've seen in spring presence that, you know, 10 years ago was an anomaly is becoming the new normal, um, where we're now, you know, it's not entirely unexpected to go full months um, without Southern resident presence in the Salish Sea. Within just the last five years, we've seen the first May, June, and August on record um, without the whales here at all. And that lower spring presence is now extending into the summer months as well. And so another way to look at this is, um, this is kind of the historical average, what we were seeing 20 years ago with how the Southern residents utilized the Salish Sea with low presence in the first part of the year, increasing presence um, you know, in the spring months. And then they were here you know, 80 to 90% of the time in the summer and then dipping back down in the fall months. And so looking at you know, an average from 20 years ago, the Southern residents were here about 190 days per year. Um, what we're seeing now with the last five years is almost an inversion of that trend where uh, still here, not very much early in the year, but um, the months they're here, the, the fewest uh, days is, you know, uh, the months that they used to be here the most from kind of that April to August time frame, and then still seeing that similar uh, fall pattern with perhaps even increased usage of Puget Sound um, in response to the strong chum runs that have been seen there. But overall, the annual uh, average presence of Southern residents has dropped from about 190 days per year to about 130 days per year over the last five years. 
Um, comparing the same thing with annual average presence between the two ecotypes, we have the southern residents here in blue and uh, bigs in orange over the last eight years or so. Um, you can see that it you know, used to be pretty similar around 150 to 200 days per year, but now we've had this total flip with uh, the southern residents about 130 days per year, big killer whales um, steadily increasing, and now here about 330 days per year in terms of confirmed sightings. Uh, wouldn't be at all surprised you know, if they're here every single day of the year somewhere in the Salish Sea. So how 2023 stacks up so far, um, this chart here is showing uh, the big killer whales in red, uh, southern residents in blue, the last three years of sightings for each month of the year. Again, uh, southern residents uh, showing that trend of um, dipping down in the spring and summer months and then sightings increasing again a bit. Um, in the fall, although this year it's been uh, lower than expected in, in September and October, it looks like uh, this will be the second lowest year on record for overall Southern resident presence, um, second only to 2021, which was the lowest year on record. Um, for big killer whales, you can see when uh, looking at whale days, they're basically uh, maxing us out here. You can't get here, you know, you can't be present more than 30 or 31 days in a month. And that's basically how much they're here from almost uh, March to October. So in addition to tracking whale days for the big killer whales, um, we're also tracking sightings, which is the number of unique groups um, that are here on a unique day. And you can see that those numbers just continue to skyrocket. Um, there was a huge jump between 2016 and 2017. It's kind of steadily been going up from there and it seems like the sky is just the limit. Um, we don't know how, how high they will continue to go, but 2023 will be another record year for a number of big killer whale sightings in the Salish Sea, um, already surpassing uh, last year's you know, 1,200 unique sightings um, in the month of October, so still two months to go um, to add to that. So just some main uh, takeaway messages from this type of tracking is that overall the southern resident killer whale presence is continuing to decline throughout the Salish Sea. Um, the drop-off that was anomalous in the spring has now become kind of the new normal and is continuing to extend into the summer months. Um, Really, the, the presence trends are driven primarily by JPOD. Um, K's and L's are only in the inland waters about 30 days um, out of the year, but we do still see all three pods coming in in the fall and early winter months, uh, especially into Puget Sound. And um, we've started a new metric that we're calling uh, speculated days as well, where especially in the winter months, we might have uh, JPOD go north on Monday and come back south in the Strait of Georgia on a Wednesday. And even though they were um, undetected on a Tuesday, you know, we're pretty certain that they were up there somewhere. And, and with that new speculated day metric for 2022 and 2023, it's really emphasizing that winter importance of the northern Strait of Georgia uh, to JPOD specifically. And then um, the rise of big killer whales uh, continues and they're here, uh, a greater portion of the population is here each year. There's a greater number of groups utilizing the area and spending longer periods of time here, you know, not just days, but weeks or sometimes months without leaving the region. Um, and so that's the, the type of information that we're tracking and collating and, and trying to get out there in, in various forms to sort of uh, inform um, what's going on as folks try to figure out what sort of protection measures uh, might make the most sense for these whales. Um, thanks again for inviting me to speak today. Thank you, Monica. Great. So we'll pause here for questions uh, from members for any of our presenters uh, today. I know that was a lot of information, but a lot of really interesting conclusions and findings. So I'm sure there's some questions. Uh, Tara. Thank you. Yeah, my question is for Caitlin. Can you at uh, Quiet Sound? Um, and just wondering um, what the next steps are on that RAS, pulling together that RAS data, and maybe on the like what the time frame is on that feasibility. Uh, study to uh, bring in the hydrophone data into RAS um, and and if it's funded, things, questions like that. Sure. So the last little bits um, for the current um, RAS improvements of connecting 
uh, ORCA network, the Washington State Settings Networks via Akarsha Data Cooperative to RAS. Um, data is flowing, uh, but the thing that we're missing is the data attribution part in the end user view of the app. We wanna make sure that we are honoring and crediting the folks who are putting in all this hard work to make sure that the data is going through. Um, so we are um, in conversations with OceanWise and the developers to uh, try to get this figured out so that when um, a, an approved uh, Mariner looks at the RAS app or desktop view and they see an alert, they will then see that it came from Orca Network. Um, so that's kind of the last bit that we want to make sure is wrapped up before we really shout this to the world and we're going to do a press release and make it kind of a big deal. Um, but yeah, that's the last bit there. Um, and then for the hydrophone um, feasibility study, it is funded by the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. Um, and the time frame is now until I think our final report is due next September. So just about a year from now. Um, and, and <clears throat> excuse me, that final report is going to say, this is what we need in order to connect these hydrophones to this system. So we are not expecting that by um, next fall, we will have hydrophones actually connected to the system. Uh, one thing that we're watching very closely is um, ECHO, uh, the program in Canada, and um, OceanWise, and JASCO, who owns one of the hydrophones um, kind of up in Canadian waters, um, are working on connecting one of JASCO's hydrophones to RAS right now. So they are building out the blueprint for what is it going to mean, what is it going to entail to put um, live hydrophone observations from an installed hydrophone into RAS and have that be alerts that push out to mariners. So we're excited to learn more about that process because that's really gonna shape how we in Washington state kind of build our requests to move that forward. Does that answer all your questions, Tara? Yeah, yeah. And just, I just wanna say kudos to, to Quiet Sound and kudos to all the, all the folks collaborating on the data. Um, that is really amazing and I think could be really, really helpful in, in um, alerting Mariners. So that's really exciting to see. Um, so thanks all of all of the folks working on that. Thank you. Yeah, Scott, did I miss anything in that explanation that you know of? No? No, just good news that, you know, there's, there's more where um, this is coming from, Tara. Um, you know, as, as Monica's talk showed, like, um, there are many, many sources of sighting data and they're growing rapidly. And similarly, you know, Orca Sound is positioned, I'm sure next year we'll have an API connection between the human and the machine de detections and Akarsha. So that once JASCO has sort of pioneered providing acoustic detections to the RAS, uh, the, the skids are greased for providing US detections. Um, I'll, I'll link to a, a project card where we've been tracking the details of the RAS integration um, from the Akarsha perspective, if anybody wants the gory details. Hannah Miller. Hi, yes, my question is for Scott. Um, I So I work for NOAA Fisheries for those that don't know me and I do some of the planning for oil spill response. Um, and so I was I kind of tuned in a little late, but I thought that you showed a layer in Irma that yeah. had, was that showing sightings of whales or hydrophones? Cause I'm not able, there's so many layers, but I'm yes. not able to find that layer. Yeah. Um, so, so it's a test layer. So you have to log in to okay. see it because um, it hasn't been fully vetted yet, but um, you should see it if you search for Akarsha. There should be a seven-day layer and a all data layer. Um, uh, but yes, you're right. The, the, I, I actually didn't know how many layers there were in Irma. And like when I found that bathymetric layer, I was like, wow, this is a really powerful tool. It's, it's for me, um, is foreshadowing where I hope we'll get in terms of ecosystem modeling, monitoring, and management is, you know, more or less 
being able to pull up any layer that you want to interpret your particular study subject. Um, so it's it's there, but in, the plan was, um, there's another project card in the same uh, GitHub CLHC organization I linked to uh, where you can see some details there, but basically we're gonna make some changes to our data scheme and clean up a couple of issues that Noah flagged for us. And then it should be a public layer amongst those hundreds of other ones. That's great. Um, who at NOAA were, were you talking with? Was it the um, Rob Bright Office was, of Response and Restoration? Uh, Rob Wright was the lead, and his devs moved faster than I could have possibly imagined. <laughs> so I'll, I'll put a link to that card as well. Uh, it has all the contact folks in it. That'd be great. Thank you. Yeah, great question. Great. Right. At this time, we did plan for a five minute break and we're running a little bit behind. So I'll welcome anyone who wants to take a, get some coffee, tea, bio break, please do so. We can reconvene at 1150. Um, but I would also welcome the Q&A to continue for those who have the stamina <laughs> for the online meeting to, to keep talking with our presenters. Um, this is recorded, so even if you have to step away, we'll, we'll be able to share the recording and the meeting summary will also be capturing these Q&As as well. So please step away if you need to, but um, if there's any other pressing questions for any of the pr presentations that we just had, feel free to unmute and continue the conversation for the presenters who don't also need to step away. <laughs> Looks like, I'm not sure, Tara, is your hand still up or is it is it just a holdover? I've been hearing the term legacy hand. Really yeah. like, I think it's a legacy hand. <laughs> okay, well, I'm gonna step away for a minute, but um, I can address questions via the chat, definitely. Yeah, great point, Caitlin, too. Feel free to keep putting questions in the chat. All right, sounds like a break was needed after all that information. So we'll reconvene at 11.50 right here. Feel free to yeah, mute, turn your video off, and we'll open up with the Encyclopedia of Puget Sound agenda topic.
Right. So we'll be returning from our break. And when you're when you're back, maybe just raise your hand or throw up a reaction so <laughs> we know folks are are back. Thanks, Tara. Right. Okay. Oh, I love the reactions. Confetti. Yay. <laughs> Wonderful. All right. So um, we're a little behind, but I think we'll still have time to get through everything. We put a lot of buffer on the latter half of the meeting. So kicking off, um, I'm going to hand it over to Scott to introduce the Encyclopedia of Puget Sound agenda item. Um, and we'll have an overview from Tom Jefferson on his contributions. So I'll hand it over to you, Scott. Yeah, thanks. Maybe I'll just quickly share my screen again um, to pull up the um, committee membership. It's always nice to sort of remember that we have committees. Um, are you seeing my screen okay? Yes. Great. Um, so, this is one of the tools I use to sort of keep track of um, how we're doing um, in terms of expertise and data products from our monitoring efforts across the various species in our purview. Um, and you'll see that there are a number of communication channels here um, in these columns, um, one of which is the Encyclopedia of Puget Sound article um, and the associated keywords. So. One of the things I've been trying to do as chair is, is uh, try to not only update what we already have provided to the encyclopedia, but keep adding new content. Um, that's come in the form of two aspirations. One is a brief treatment of a couple pages for those species that we don't have any information about in the encyclopedia, and then profiles, which can be you know ultimately as long as an encyclopedia needs them to be. So um, thanks to support from Jeff Rice and the Encyclopedia of Puget Sound staff and editors, um, we've been able to start filling in some of these uh, that are, you know, you can see in this column. And uh, flagged over here is um, what we've been trying to work on this year and we're thinking about working on next year. So in 2023, uh, we had seed funding for harbor seals, uh, update uh, California sea lions, stellar sea lions, um, talked about um, working on gray whales. And then for 2024, we were thinking about minkies and uh, humpbacks. So that's sort of a snapshot of where we were last spring. And hopefully um, after Tom gets us a little presentation and Cindy perhaps in the, the winter meeting, along with others, um, we'll be able to update the spreadsheet. So there are other ways that I think we can um, magnify and um, in partnership with the Puget Sound Partnership and uh, all of its publications. You know, we, we try to do that through the Marine Waters Report, for example, um, and of course the vital signs. So there are, there are probably more coming that we can anticipate when PSIMP gets its own website. Um, but for the, for the foreseeable future, this is the, uh, these are the main communication channels that we've been prioritizing. Scott, do we want uh, to for Tom to share his screen if he has to, to present the overview? Yeah, I think that's a good next step. I'll stop sharing. Um, <clears throat> good morning, everybody. Uh, I don't have any slides, so I'm just going to talk for a few minutes about kind of my experience with the process. Um, I don't know for the rest of you how much experience you've had with the uh, Encyclopedia Puget Sound, and uh, probably some of you uh, are pretty familiar with it and have been involved in writing some of the profiles and articles and others maybe not. Um, this was my first involvement with it. Um, and I guess for me, it grew out of um, a project that we completed recently uh, with Maris Maltea and Eric Ward um, looking at uh, distribution and abundance of the two sea lion species, California and stellar sea lions in Puget Sound and in other inland Washington waters. 
Um, and so the timing, I guess, be, of when this uh, was decided that these species profiles should be written up kind of coincided with that. So that's how I became involved. Um, and um, the two accounts were, I think we started working on them sometime in the spring or early summer. Um, and we completed uh, a draft, uh, I think it was in September. Um, and uh, my co-author, Stephanie Norman, I saw just, just popped on. Hi, Stephanie. Um, so um, the process, in my opinion, was very smooth and uh, very well run. Um, I really like the fact that uh, we were provided with a very detailed template um, of the kind of information that we were supposed to present, um, the level of detail that it would include, um, and you know, even information about you know what we should include in terms of photographs and that kind of thing. And and that was very useful because obviously you know you could write fifty pages about uh, these species um, in huge amounts of detail or you can summarize something in a, you know, a, a few paragraphs. So it was very useful to have that kind of guidance. Uh, and I'm not sure exactly where that came from. I'm not sure, Scott, you may be able to enlighten us in, t in terms of where the template came from, but it was very useful and very helpful for us, I think, in, in getting to know, you know, what kind of information and what level of detail um, was desired for the profile. Um, yeah, that's, that's, a good reminder, Tom, that I could go over a bit more of the history. Um, you can see that there was there's most attention, interestingly, in like deepest attention to harbor seals in the, the encyclopedia. And so this re science review is interesting. Um, let's just take a quick quick look at these two uh, because it it was reviewed by um, the science panel of the partnership and given a special banner. You can see this green banner up here, but this was quite a while ago, and I'm not sure that how much this can, has continued to be done. Um, it's perhaps something that could be revived, but um, since then, there was another update, and this is sort of the, um, perhaps, I, I think this is the most detailed profile, um, and you can see that this is uh, has a brief introduction here, and then the PDF, which is uh, order 20 to 30 pages. So. Um, there's really quite a span of, of content in the encyclopedia, and I think they're open to us proposing new formats. But to answer your, your good question, um, to some extent, the, the brief came from this idea uh, of this science review, and the profile um, came from this, this uh, effort by Zier and Gatos back in 2014. So it's a bit of a work in progress. Um, but luckily, there's been some, you know, seed funding of a stipend to have lead authors um, drive us forward a little bit. So I'm glad to hear that it, you know, the template mostly worked for you. Um, yeah. But it is something that we could negotiate uh, and alter over the over time. Yeah, I was wondering whether or not the template um, was going to be kind of a permanent thing for other species uh, accounts that were written up, or whether or not that was going to um, be changed over time. That sounds like it's me. It, it's it's potentially variable, it could be changed. Yeah, I think it's, I think Jeff's very open to suggestions if anybody has a, a you know, brilliant idea. My, um, my feeling having dealt with a lot of software and open data recently is that an interesting model for encyclopedias in the current era might be to retain all the old versions of articles, but create a mechanism for creating new versions that, you know, you stand on the shoulders of these giants in the the way that I, I hope we can do now, um, almost 10 years later, and but still have the encyclopedia give credit and a link to the previous PDF by Zier and Gatos, but update the authorship for the, you know, the most recent treatment for the species. So sort of a version control, if you will, for for the most detailed accounts, I think might make sense. And, and Jeff seemed open to that idea when we discussed it briefly this last spring. And Scott, um... I'm just maybe a little confused. The the template that Tom's referring to, is that the Harbor Seal ones or that's something separate? Uh, they're, they're general templates that um, we iterated a little bit when Monica was working on the Biggs, leading the Biggs article. Um, and so in our shared Google Drive, uh, I know we're, like historically split between Box and Google, but 
uh, these were established a long time ago before Box, and so um, in in this uh, part of our working directory, we have drafts of the briefs and um, and profiles, and you can see down here there's a general template as of uh, 2023. So if we look at that, I think this is an example of a um, it's a pretty generic template, but it has some basic who eats them, what's their distribution, what do they eat, sort of biology. Um, so there's a little bit of a superstructure without trying to be too constraining. So you can do a brief treatment of these, or you can go as deep as you want over time and start to create a profile. Yeah, and I think the template, um, I liked I liked the way it was set up in terms of the fact that it, it you know, it's obviously geared towards um, a more general audience. So, you know, there's not a lot of information in there about detailed anatomical details or very super technical aspects and that kind of thing, but it's geared towards the kind of things that, you know, members of the general public and not necessarily just, you know, marine mammal specialists would be interested in, um, including, you know, information on population size and, you know, interactions with other species and things like that, that um, I think would make it more, uh, appealing to a, a wider audience. So I think that was, uh, I was glad to see that that when I got a copy of the template, it was, uh, I think, well done in that respect. And I linked both articles that Tom and Stephanie co-authored in the chat. That's great. Let's take a look at them. Yeah. <laughs> Good idea, Nicole. And as part of this agenda item, we also put in a, two discussion questions for members if they had any feedback, but um, Scott already alluded to this internal peer review process that is still being explored exactly what that would look like on the Encyclopedia of Puget Sound website. Um, but if members are interested in that, is that something that would be valuable to be coordinated? and what species should we prioritize for articles next year, which um, is also within that committee document that or um, spreadsheet you have. So if there's any input from members on those two questions that are in the agenda, we would I'd be interested in hearing from from you all. Are they downloadable as PDFs though, any of these articles or yeah, no, interesting. That's a good question. It, it's interesting. It, it seems to be evolving over over the years. Um, I think in the case of the Zer and Gatos one, it was. Um, if we And th thank you, Frankie. I see that you have got a draft done and I didn't even know about it. So that's fantastic. Um, we can get that over to the editors. Uh, yeah, so if we look at Monica's, I think we'll see maybe get a different answer, Stephanie. That's this one here. And the difference could be that that's a profile and yeah, which I don't Much exactly know. It. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Stephanie, do you think they should be PDFs? Um, I, I, I think it'd be nice if maybe someone from the public, I mean, you could just, PDF, save the whole, like click on set of print, you know, just save as a PDF, but then you get all the background stuff on the website. But um, I mean, I, I, th I think it'd be nice just to have that option available if people want to share it with someone. I mean, they could share a link, but if they want to print it out and hand it out to a class or mm -hmm. for whatever reason, um, just to be able to have that option. Yeah, I don't think that'll be hard for Jeff to do. Um, I can ask him. I think it's a good suggestion. Yeah, I agree. I think that'd be helpful. Um, the other thing that I am happy to ask them if if folks are willing to to do it is, um, you know, my one complaint, Tom, about this last iteration is that it was hard for me to keep up and you know contribute during the summer. Um, but that's the way his that's the way the Encyclopedia Puget Sound funding cycle um, has worked historically. So. Yeah. I think I'm starting to like the idea that, you know, we give authors support, but we're not trying to publish the uh, 
publish immediately. Like we're trying to create a draft like um, like Frankie's for the mink Minkies. And then over the winter, we take the time as a committee to review it and reach consensus that it's worthy of a banner that says Peace and Marine Mammal Work Group Review. Um, and then in the spring, we hand it back to the editors the, the author already having been paid on time for generating the draft, um, but the product actually not coming out until we've had we've all had a chance to sort of calmly review it, review it over the winter. Yeah, that probably makes a lot of sense. That the timeline was pretty tight for this one. Um, like I said, we just started like maybe very late spring or early summer, and then we completed everything in September, and I think it got published in October. So it was a pretty, there wasn't a lot of time uh, for, uh, you know, to, to put the thing together. It worked okay for me because uh, my field work that I do is, is, is more limited these days. And also it's not very much uh, geared towards the summer. I'm further south down here in San Diego. So we have uh, better conditions to work throughout the year. So the summer isn't quite as busy for me as it is for a lot of you guys up there, I know. So, um, but since most of the folks that are going to be working on these ones in the future probably are from up there, I, I think you're probably right. It would probably be better to give people more time outside the summer season when they're less busy to uh, work on these things and comment on them and stuff. Okay. Well, I, I will, um, I'll take those ideas back to, to Jeff and see if we can sort of alter the calendar and um, maybe do a trial run this winter of, of uh, opening up each of the drafts to a little broader critique and review. One species that I think would be really good to add to the list um, is dolph porpoise, because even though they're very rare in, in Puget Sound and the Salish Sea, uh, most of the Salish Sea waters these days, they were pretty common in the past. And I think it's a species that will be very interesting to the public, especially in terms of the apparent sort of negative correlation between harbor porpoise and dolph porpoise numbers in Puget Sound. Um, so it's one of those species that might not jump to people's mind as one that's really important to to put a profile together for right away, since they have become pretty rare in uh, in these waters. But the fact that they were pretty common in the past, I think might make it more um, interesting as a species to cover quickly or soon. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, there's a potentially interesting story there. <laughs> so yeah, mm -hmm. it might be something that the public might find pretty interesting. Any other suggestions from folks about prioritization? I would think that anything that we get unusual, uh, like we like the the um, beluga whale that we had, you know, a couple years ago. Uh, anything, any extra liminal sightings might be kind of nice to write up to just to, you know, to have documented um, in the encyclopedia. Yeah, I was thinking about that as well. And, and and also species that might at first have seemed extra limital, but with, you know, mm. ocean temperatures warming and species that were further south moving moving north, like bottlenose dolphins, you know, common dolphins, um, maybe maybe resource dolphins. I'm not sure if they fit that, but there's a number of other species that that, you know, were not considered regular uh, inhabitants of Puget Sound um, in the past, but now we're seeing it at least some numbers fairly regularly. And again, there's an interesting story there that, that the public probably is very interested in. So doing a maybe a maybe a profile on, you know, extra limbal species and maybe another one on species that, you know, are becoming <laughs> regulars in the sound or seemingly becoming regulars in the sound might be kind of uh, valuable. Those are great ideas. And uh, we have some suggestions in the chat too, I think. Other suggestions can keep coming in the chat, but we should move on to our final agenda item. Thank you, Tom and Stephanie, for providing your insights um, from your work with the, the encyclopedia. Really appreciate that discussion. And with that, I'll hand it to Corey and Candice, who will be taking us through the monitoring inventory framework for Southern resident, resident killer whales. Thank you, Nicole. Um, hi, everyone. For those I haven't met directly, my name is Candace Pundell, and I work with Corey at True and Collaborative, and I'm part of the uh, Marine Mammals Work Group coordination team. You might recognize me from as note taker from previous 
uh, previous meetings or at the ORCA occupancy workshop that we held earlier this year. Um, so as a little introduction, I know we're a little bit short on time, so let me just go ahead and paste the mural now so people can start popping in there. But as a little introduction, we are building off the ORCA occupancy workshops and creating an inventory tool that captures the full picture of monitoring efforts and programs related to the state's ORCA task force recommendations for Southern resident um, recovery. So as part of that, this inventory is to help get a sense of all the programs out there related to prey, vessels, and contaminants affecting ORCAs. Uh, we've had discussions with a few of you about your work, and then last month or a couple months ago, we had the chance to receive input from the Toxics work group um, on monitoring programs related to contaminants. So for today, um, our goal is to get your input on where you see existing gaps for monitoring efforts and brainstorm opportunities to support better efficiency, efficiency across efforts. So let's see here. Let me... I see a few people popping on already. Perfect. I'm going to hide everyone's cursor. Um, and it might be helpful to share my screen. Oh, yes, Tara. Oh, I just wanted to say, um, I think I saw um, someone from the partnership on earlier. And the I also wanted to mention that the Puget Sound Partnership is um, working on their uh, science plan, work plan for, I think it's 22, 2020 five through or 2024 through 2026. I'm not sure what the exact time frame is, but um, you know, some of this information could also feed into needs for um, the science panels work plan in the future. Just wanted to mention that. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, perfect. Well, I see people are popping on. Um, but today's exercise will be pretty quick. So we're using the mural to gather your input. Uh, I know I think we've used mural before in this work group, but as a reminder, you can scroll to zoom in and out to better read the small text. And then to move around, just click and drag your cursor or use the map in the bottom right to navigate. So it's pretty intuitive. If you're having technical difficulties, please let me know and we can troubleshoot. So as I mentioned, ultimate goal for today is to inventory current and upcoming programs that are in support of ORCA task force recommendations related to prey vessels and contaminants. Today, we'd really like to focus on identifying gaps in monitoring. So let's start on the left-hand side. If you can please sign in with your name and a brief note describing your focus of work, about one to two sentences. Um, many of your work uh, many of you work on efforts that are relevant to our inventory, so we may follow up with you for a brief interview if we notice we don't have your work already captured in the inventory. So it would just be really helpful to kind of have you sign in, and we can call on you as needed. And if you're having trouble accessing the mural, um, or if you're calling in to the meeting, you can shout it out or put it in the chat, and we'll be sure to capture it there. Or is there anything you want to add before I move on? Thank you. Yeah, while people are adding their um, notes in here, I guess I just want to reiterate too, and Candace, you introduced this great, is that uh, we want to have this sentence or two of the work that you do because we already know what many of you are focusing on, but we've been building an inventory tool that we're not going to share with you today because the, the volume of information I think would be overwhelming. So we're going to use whatever you drop here at a really high level to kind of uh, our second to make sure that we've captured the nature of work that's relevant to this inventory. So that's part of the purpose for this piece. Um, and just to clarify too, that tool is something that we'll be producing after the fact from this. So um, we won't be sharing like the actual product and stuff today, as you had mentioned, Candace. Thanks. Thanks, Corey. So if you Mouse on over, we have the ORCA task force recommendations as related to prey, vessels, and contaminants. Um, I'm going to let you kind of scan through that on your own screen. I know it's pretty small. There are a lot. So uh, I can also drop a link on the recommendations in the chat so that you can peruse that on your own, kind of give a little bit more 
a background about the recommendations on their website. Okay, I already see some people fill in gaps and needs. That's perfect. So this is kind of what we're hoping for here. So based on the conversations we've had, we know there are potential gaps or research needs when it comes to Southern resident killer whale recovery. Um, for, for example, we've heard further need to study the impacts of recreational boating. Um, are there any others that you can think of? And again, feel free to go off mute to discuss out loud with the group and we'll capture it here on the mural. Uh, or go ahead and double click on the sticky note to add your thoughts. Scott, I think you are the one who brought up recreational boating impacts. Is there anything you wanted to add to that? Perfect. Focused on populating. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's, I could tell it. The focus. Uh, was <laughs> I was muted. Sorry, I'm going back and forth between mural and Zoom. Um, what number, Candace? Are you thinking of? Under gaps and needs, I think it was Corey. Was it your conversation with Scott? But when you mentioned that recreational boating impacts was kind of a gap that you saw. Oh. Yeah. yeah, Scott, feel free to chime in here if you want. I think it's just really related to our conversation about acoustics and just um, particularly connected to some of the regulatory decisions based around recreational boating. So just flagging it as a potential gap. Yeah, it's been a while since I've looked at the actual recommendations, but it's certainly true just listening um, to the live hydrophones that commercial ships dominate the soundscape, but recreational boaters raise receive levels at the shoreline and probably in most of ha critical habitat, um, about the same amount, just for shorter times as they go zooming past whales. Um, so it's partially noise reduction, um, but it's also, especially with commercial whale watching vessels not uh, being allowed to watch Southern residents, like making sure that we fill the educational gap and ensure that recreational boaters know how to behave around Southern residents and follow the law. So I, I think there's there's be whale wise and outreach associated with it's probably good, but on the acoustic side, I think there's a lot of room for educating recreational boaters about their noise impacts. Thank you, Scott. You want to want me to elaborate um, in writing as well, or if you want to pop it on in that we. That'd be very helpful. Um, I do think we have your notes from conversations as well that um, we've been uh, kind of keeping to help inform the tool. So if you want to capture the mural, you totally feel free to pop it on there. But I'm going to move forward here to collaboration and information sharing. So um, what are some current avenues you utilize for sharing information collaborating on work or creating uh, efficiencies across programs related to Southern resident health and recovery. And then on top of that, what do you think can improve? You know, where do you think there could be better efficiencies across the monitoring efforts? Okay. And then reflections and final thoughts. So to close out, do you have any reflections and final thoughts to share about the ORCA task force recommendations? Again, we have them in this middle column here, the left column here, or the website that I uh, popped in the chat. I hope my driving is not making anybody uh, motion sick, <laughs> so trying to go slow.
All right. So Can I ask, uh, just as folks are starting to drop some thoughts in, um, I see a couple of ideas in here that I would love to encourage you to elaborate on a bit more, specifically the support for monitoring. Great. That's a little broad too. So if you could add some more specificity, that would be really helpful for us. You're talking specifically funding. Uh, is there other kind of support that would be useful? Uh, what does that mean to you? Thanks. Yeah. Okay. So um, up next, we're kind of we're continuing to reach out for additional interviews to round out the inventory tool. Um, and then we could be connecting with you if your focus of work description lines up with further needs. So thank you so much for including those in your sign-in. And Candace, did we talk about keeping this live for a while after this meeting, a week or so? Uh, I haven't mentioned that, no, but that was a thought that we're going to dive into is that I think we can leave this live for a week and um Nicole's nodding. Can we add it to the follow-up email? <laughs> yes, I think, especially since this was a jam-packed meeting, thank you all for hanging, <laughs> hanging in there. And we've um, had a lot of information shared. So maybe when you're a little fresher, you can return to this mural. And folks had to drop off as well. So um, want to make sure that all members have an opportunity to provide their insights on this as well. So I will follow-up in my immediate follow-up email. Not, the meeting summary will come about a week or so behind this meeting, but in the immediate follow-up, we'll include this link and um, just an ex a brief explanation of what we're looking for as well. But really appreciate everyone's uh, efforts to, to populate this mural board right now. Okay, thank you, Candace and Corey, um, for packing that into the last few few minutes of the meeting. Um, folks are dropping off, but just want to go over action items and next steps here. So, um, I'm going to follow up uh, with an email shortly after this meeting. At, at, definitely by the end of today, that just reiterates the announcements with links um, that were shared at the beginning of the meeting. We'll be following up with a meeting summary and the recording of this meeting um, in about a week or so. And I also wanted to flag that we're looking forward to 2024. So if you have future agenda items that you're really passionate about or want to make sure that we're including in future agendas, please put them in chat, send me an email, um, always welcome those recommendations. And we're also looking to plan out our 2024 meeting schedule um, so that we're not necessarily asking for your availability prior to each uh, meeting scheduling. So I'll be sending out a poll that seeks to schedule all three meetings in 2024. If that makes sense to people. Again, just want to thank all the presenters today. It was wonderful to hear the updates. Um, I'm excited to track those publications that are either recently published or they're coming out soon. And we'll want to make sure that we're sharing them with the work group. Anything Nicole? to add, Scott? Well, yeah, I see we have five minutes. So I yeah. Didn't... Um, I, I put a question in the chat for Monica. I'm wondering if I could, um, if she's still on, it looks like maybe it's sort of, it may be a 2024 aspiration or even further down, but I am feeling strongly as a coordinator of the listening networks and an observer and participant in the visual networks that the door is opening to community scientists helping us monitor more um, and to do it more scientifically over time. Uh, it's already happening. Like um, the track of the of JPod leaving yesterday was so rich that uh, uh, it's not just a point observation anymore. It's a track. Um, I know Brad, you were out there part of the time, but you know I, I was able to pull the data from Akarsha and compute speeds of Southern residents 
they transited Colvo's Passage at an average of 13 knots. And they essentially did the race to the uh, the race called the 7048 from Tacoma to Port Townsend faster than any humans have, although we've been trying for five years. Um, so their average speed was 8.3 knots between the south end of Vashon and Port Townsend. And I'm wondering, like, how what we can do with the track data is one question for and it's partially for you monica because you know you're getting the some of the richest tracks through the southern through the san juans for the eco both ecotypes um but the other thing that i think maybe monica you can speak to as a birder is like to me i, I see in california the same folks who are using the whale alert mobile app for putting in point data are also using other applications to do effort surveys and so there are volunteer groups within the Channel Islands and um, Fairlawns National Marine Sanctuaries where they they go out and they do effort surveys and get in a boat, go on a straight line and do a trans a line transect. Um, and they're using software that we could be leveraging. So I guess I just wanted to to ask that question: is like, do you, do other people feel like the door is opening to training these already pretty expert community scientists to do even more in terms of monitoring the ecosystem? Yeah, I agree with you, Scott, that there's a huge opportunity to leverage these very knowledgeable folks to collect additional data. I'm curious, when you're talking about surveys, are you thinking like private private boaters or or what are you envisioning? Birding is a little more accessible in that regard and that you can you know go on a walk anywhere. Um, yep. Well, so... There are a lot of different types of effort surveys, and uh, you know I, I didn't do my PhD on them like Rob Rob uh, Williams did, but uh, I see the bird folks like using um, eBird. I think is the particular application where you know they keep track of how long you're standing on the shoreline watching, and that's one way to track effort. Is sort of you know are you on task rather than just you know stopping your car because you saw a whale and putting one point in and then not watching anymore. Um, we don't capture that well. We don't really encourage people to tell Orca Network or the whale sighting groups in your favorite Facebook to tell us when you're not seeing things. Um, but so there's apps that can do it temporarily. And then there, there are many software suites that folks like Casey are probably using at WDFW. And I've talked with Scott Pearson about trying to align on the software we use for line transect surveys. Um, and there are probably other ideas out there that looks like Aaron's putting in. Um, so yeah, it could be boat-based. It could be happening on the ferries, right? We have sort of line transects happening all the time across Puget Sound. If we trained folks to do you know, a specific effort survey once, once a month, let's say, um, maybe that would be interesting if it was done on every, every ferry um, line, including the black ball line between Port Angeles and Victoria. Um, there's just a few thoughts like maybe it's worth a, you know, a whole topic in a future meeting, but I do feel like folks have amazing cameras. Some of them have drones, uh, which have been amazing, honestly, in Port Susan, John, like I, I know there, there are ethical concerns and we need to make sure we follow NOAA guidance, but there's no doubt I've learned a lot about Big's behavior foraging in P Port Susan and, and, you know, the gray whales and like how exactly, um, you know, compliments to your tag data are coming from community scientists, for better or worse. Yeah, I think maybe a future topic for discussion. There's a lot, um, even in just what you just said, that we could delve into further. But I think there's a lot of possibilities there. Yeah, uh, maybe a good way to... Um, I, mean, I think it'd be interesting to get Holly and John when they're not too busy in the winter meeting to come back and give us an update on their body condition work. Um, but yes, surveys of haulouts um, via drone seems like I know they've done they've talked in a previous meeting about a little pilot study they did in the San Juans using drones to enumerate harbor seals um, beyond what WDFW already does during the winter time. Uh, or sorry, during the during the summertime the low tide during the day period. So maybe, yeah, those ancillary measures might be a way to um, catalyze the conversation. But, right. but I think it's much broader, honestly. 
Yeah, that that makes sense to bring forward at a future meeting. So we'll we'll flag that. Thanks, Scott. And yeah. thanks everyone again. It is 12:30, so we will adjourn. And I hope everyone has a great uh holiday season. Yeah, thanks so much, Nicole. Appreciate it. Thanks, Corey and Candace. Thanks, everyone. Y'all are amazing. <laughs>